Lord Granatha, I want to ask you now a handful of questions on the issue of self-sufficiency and the government's policy in that regard. Can we just start by looking at your witness statement, WITN 5282001 again, and just pick a matter of background up at page 7, paragraph 1.7. Um, where you say this, in the case of policy with regard to blood and blood products, there was quite a long history, some of it involving governments of a different political persuasion. But then, as now, it was not the convention to share with other governments the details of decisions taken by ministers in previous administrations, or the official advice on which those decisions were based, nor to grant access to the papers of previous administrations, at least unless there was felt to be a real need to do so. The point is more fully set out in the Directory of Civil Service, and you give a, ref a guidance, you give a reference to that. Consistently with this convention, and as far as I can recall, I was not briefed in depth on any earlier history or how policy had been derived. And if we just look at the document that you refer to in your statement, so show me WITN 5282002, This is the extract from the Directory of Civil Service Guidance to which you referred, I think. Yes. And we can see it's entitled Access by Ministers and Special Advisors to Documents of a Previous Administration, um, Documents of a Former Administration of the Property of the Crown, Access to them by any person not entitled in an official capacity to see them, requires the agreement of the government of the day until they're released as public records. Ministers of a former administration, whether currently in office or not, may see but not retain official documents which they saw as members of that administration. And then three, and I think this is what you were referring to in your statement, it is an established convention that ministers of a current administration may not generally see documents of a former administration of a different political party. And then um, the, the guidance sets out uh, uh, um, uh, a description given by the then Prime Minister in a written parliamentary uh, uh, answer on the 24th of January 1980. I'm not going to go through the detail of that. But that's, that's the convention to which you referred in your statement. Yes, it is. <coughs> and, and so is it right to understand that you would, you therefore, you, you think possibly because of that convention, um, don't think you'd have received any kind of detailed briefing about the history of the self-sufficiency policy? No, I was only aware that the um, BPL was going to be rebuilt, um, but I wasn't given any information about the background leading up to those decisions taken in the 70s and uh, up to 79. Um, before we just look at, at what then um, you were being told about, by your civil servants about the policy and, and, and some um, interactions you had uh, in relation to it. Um, do you have any observations or views upon upon the convention that, that you've described and uh, and whether it's, it, its impact on, on good government or its impact on the public interest? Well, I don't, I don't think I could be, uh, speak generally about no. it because it is a convention. In terms of my own involvement in this particular issue, it would obviously have been... Um, at least interesting, and probably more than that, to have been made more aware. But um, having said that, uh, the, the process was in train, albeit extremely slowly, in, in my view, um, to, uh, to redevelop BPL. So it would have been helpful, it would have been interesting, but perhaps not essential. And, and is it right to understand that um, uh, um, you... You, you, you did understand that there was a policy of achieving self-sufficiency. You weren't aware um, yes. of its history, but you knew that was the policy. I, I, I believe I did, yes. Um, and again, if we just go back to a document we've looked at on more than one occasion now, that original briefing um, that, that you got from, in writing from Dr. Wolford, DHSC 0002309 underscore 124... Um, we can see if we go um, to the one bit I haven't marked up. Yes, um, uh, to the third page, 
we looked at it when we were looking at the uh, um, issue of the March plasma. But it's the paragraph below haemophiliacs. Sorry, if we go back further up, Jeremy. Um, uh, it, it, where it says, it's thought that the greatest risk to haemophiliacs at present is from the use of factor eight concentrate prepared from American plasma. Although the blood products laboratory is to be redeveloped over the next three years at a cost of £21 million to achieve national self-sufficiency in blood products, until this time, some 50% will have to be imported. So it, would it be right to understand that you, um, you would have read from this, first of all, that the redevelopment of BPL was underway, and at that point in time, it's being said it's a three-year project, and the goal of it was to achieve national self-sufficiency? Yes. Uh, and I think it's right to understand that you, you, you weren't aware, no doubt possibly because of the convention you've described, of, of particular... Um, statements that had been made um, by Lord Owen or Dr David Owen as he then was in the 1970s? At that point, no, but at, at a, a point a bit later than this, I replied to a yeah. letter which had been written to Kenneth Clark by David Owen and I gave a short answer which said, yes, it was still going on. Yes, um, and, and, and in fairness, we'll, we'll, we'll just look at that. Yes, I'm so sorry, my question wasn't sufficiently clear. You're right. At the point in time when you take up your role, the information you have, as I understand it, about the government's policy in relation to self-sufficiency is essentially as summarised in the paper there. Exactly. Um, so you don't know more of the history. But then you did receive a letter, as you say, or, or, you, or you were sent a copy of a letter to, to Kenneth Clark, DHSC 00002098, And we can see it's from David Owen to Mr. Clark, 19th of October, 1983. It says, I've had a letter recently from the mother of a haemophilic child about the use of imported factor eight concentrates. In my time as Minister for Health, I know that we set in train a capital investment programme to make us self-sufficient in blood and all the factors because of worries about imported blood products. I wonder if you could let me know what stage this has now reached. And I think you were asked to reply on behalf of Mr. Clark. Um, or, or asked to reply in any event, uh, and it's at DHSC 000208. Um, I think it probably says 10th of November 1983. Um, Dear Dr Owen, thank you for your letter of the 19th of October about the supply of blood products in this country. I can assure you that the government is committed to making this country self-sufficient in blood products. Over £2 million has already been spent on improving the production facilities at the Blood Products Laboratory at Elstree Hearts, and a major three-year redevelopment programme is now underway. When this is complete, the Central Blood Laboratories Authority will have a new laboratory of a size capable of meeting the demands of England and Wales for blood products. Um, so, again, that, that, that essentially reflects what your understanding was of the government's position, does it? Yes. Can, can I then just explore with you briefly the question of well, by when it was understood or believed that self-sufficiency might be achieved? Um, I think there were probably four letters... Uh, or documents, um, rather, that may assist to look at. The first is DHSC 0002071. And we've already looked at this um, uh, in part. Um, so we can see... In the second paragraph of your letter to the Reverend Tanner, um, and this is the letter of the 28th of September 1983, following the meeting of the 8th of September 1983, yes. um, you say, I would first of all like to reassure members of the Haemophilia Society of the government's commitment to self-sufficiency in blood products. The Central Blood Laboratories Authority has embarked on a £21 million redevelopment programme. The target date for completion is the end of 1985, by which time the authority aimed to have a new laboratory of a size capable of meeting the demands of England and Wales for blood products. So very similar to what you've said to yes. Dr David Owen. And, uh, you, so you've set out there the target date for completion 
as I understand it, of the redevelopment program. What was your understanding of, of the date by which the UK might, or England and Wales um, might be self-sufficient? Was it immediately on completion of the development program or a further period no, it, of time? It wouldn't have been immediately on completion because uh, any new enterprise has to be worked up to ensure that it is capable of doing what was intended of it. And um, that would have been a process taking a period of time. I, I can't remember what the um, time period would be, but I imagine probably six, nine months or something in order to ensure that it worked correctly and did what it had did always been intended to do. So it, it wouldn't just crack off producing all the right amount at day one. It would be a, be a work-up procedure. So what your, the, the significance here of the date of the end of 1985, in your mind, was that's the date when the redevelopment of the plant... That was my understanding. That's when the, the plant would have been completed and then the work-up would have followed that. And then if we go next to DHSC 00000443... This is the briefing note from Dr. Smithers that you were sent in August 1984. Um, again, we've looked at it on more than one occasion, but if we can go to page three of the document, please, show me. Under the heading, halfway down the page, haemophiliac patients with antibody to HTLV3. Um, if we pick it up about halfway down that paragraph where it says, as ministers are aware building of the plants required to extract factor eight from blood donation given in this country is going ahead at Elstree, and it is expected that self-sufficiency will be obtained by 1987-88. In the meantime, sufferers from haemophilia must continue to be supported with factor eight concentrates obtained from abroad. So that does appear, is this right, to be talking not just about completion of the plant, the redevelopment, but actually achieving self-sufficiency. Yes. And it puts it rather longer than, than six to nine months. It's well, six to nine months was me plucking I up a, what I thought to be a sensible figure out of the air, so yes, probably a bit longer than that. Um, uh, so that's August 84. Um, if we then go to PRSC 2251. Um, this is a press statement, November 1984, uh, and it is, of course, by, by Mr. Patton, not by you. Yes. Um, uh, Britain to be self-sufficient in blood products by late 1986 is, is the headline. Mm -hmm. And then if we look further down, um, it says, John Patton, Parliamentary Secretary for Health, today said that Britain should be self-sufficient in blood products by late 1986. He also announced action which has been taken on four fronts to combat the spread of AIDS in this country. Mr. Patton said, our multi-million pound development project at the Blood Products Laboratory, Elstree, is on target for completion early in 1986, and this should enable us to become self-sufficient in blood products, such as Factor VIII, which is a clotting agent required by haemophiliacs, by the end of that year. This will mean that we no longer have to import Factor VIII from abroad. So here it's being said, rather shorter period than Dr. Smithers' briefing note, pro the plant, the redevelopment plant, should be completed by the beginning of 1986 or early in 1986, self-sufficiency by the end of 1986. Is that how you understand That's it? That's how I understand it, yes. And, and, and are you able to assist us in understanding why there is this variation between the suggestion that it's 87, 88 by Dr Smithers and, and Mr Patton saying it's the end of 86? No, I'm not able to help you at all. Um, and then the last document I wanted to ask you about on this particular topic is I think a document that you, you may have been given ye yesterday evening or this morning um, it's COLL 609 um, and it's a letter of the 15th of March 1985 um, it, it's um, you responding um, I think if we go to the second page, we can see it without the I put it somewhere compliment slip. Yes. Ah, that's a clearer version, yes. Yes. 
So this is you responding to a letter from an MP, and I, I'm not going to name the MP Understood. or the people involved, no. um, but some constituents, um, had, uh, or, uh, the MP is writing on behalf of some constituents, um, uh, um, and has written to Kenneth Clark, and, and you're here responding, um, and you say, um, you make the point in the second paragraph that the country is already self-sufficient in whole oh, blood. Yes. Um, and then if we go down to the bottom of the page... You then talk about the position in relation to blood products. If I, I'll just read the last two paragraphs, but it's really the last one I want to ask you about. You say, um, we are, however, very conscious of the difficulties faced by people with haemophilia who need treatment with blood products. We are especially aware of the additional pressures which the risk for maids must involve for parents of haemophiliac children. It was with the needs of haemophiliacs very much in mind that we decided in 1982 that the UK must become self-sufficient in blood products. Just pausing there, and I'm just going to make an observation, Lord Arthur, which will explain why I'm not asking you about that. There is, a, there is an issue about whether it, it was correct or not to say that that was a decision by the government in 1982, but I'm not proposing to ask you about that. You weren't in post in 1982. No. It, it's a matter that can be picked up to the extent it needs to with other witnesses. Yes, thank you. But then the last paragraph says this. To achieve this goal we commissioned the rebuilding of the Blood Products Laboratory in Elstree, and the project is presently on target for completion early in 1986. Self-sufficiency of itself will not guarantee AIDS-free blood products, but we shall then no longer be dependent upon imported factor rate produced from pooled plasma given by donors who are paid for their blood. I'm, I'm, I don't need to ask you to look at anything else in the letter. Now, in that last paragraph, you're, you're talking about completion of the project early in 1986 and then the next sentence goes on immediately to talk about self-sufficiency and it, it it might be said that it is at least giving the impression that self-sufficiency will be achieved upon completion of the build you certainly don't give a later date in this letter for the for, for the achievement of self-sufficiency it, it, it could be read that way but um the, the uh that the project is presently on target for completion. That's to say, the, uh, the, the, the commission rebuilding was going to be completed by early 86. Um, but I, in all these instances, there is uh, commissioning is sort of setting it up and getting it going. And then there is the gradual work up to ensure that it can do its, the job that it was intended to do. And, uh, but I agree, that's not spelt out there. And, and I, I do appreciate, Lord Glenarfa, that you've been given this letter in the course of your evidence, so you've not had the opportunity, for example, to try and inquire as to whether the drafting process or, 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 or um, um, uh, the terms of the letter that you were responding to. No, and I, do, I do, don't in the background do. Um, uh, so... Are, are you able to assist us any further beyond the, the documents that we've looked at as to um, the date by which the government in 1984, 1985 um, was aiming to achieve self-sufficiency? Well, I, I can only recall that it was um, due to be completed... Uh, at the, I think at one point we were talking about the end of 1985, yeah. but it, it got extended, and I think... Uh, when it came to the uh, laying of the foundation stone, if I remember rightly, which um, uh, Lord Fowler and I went to, um, he was then talking about the first of uh, January 1987. Well, I was splitting hairs, and, but but it was you know right at the change of the year, so to speak. I don't recall any more about that, um, nor do I recall in detail. Um, the, the, the history of the whole project, obviously before my time, but I was always given to understand that it, uh, indeed I went up there in uh, in, uh, what, in 83, I think it, it was. Yes, I think that's right. To, to, to visit and see round, and I was talked through what was going on. At that stage, I think it had started. There was a shell of a building. Uh, there was always... Um, and I'm pretty sure I discussed it with the people there, um, the fact that uh, science was moving on in the blood products field in terms of machinery, equipment, and one thing and another, and there was sufficient space there to adapt and take on new equipment uh, in order to um, allow the, the uh, laboratory to fulfill its function. 
So there was a certain amount of flexibility in the space arrangements, as far as I can recall from my visit. Um, and then just, just on the issue of the redevelopment of BPL, and I, 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 it's something you deal with in, I think, Section 85 of your statement onwards, but I think we can probably take it fairly shortly. Um, I think there came a point in around September of 1984 when you were made aware of there having been a very substantial escalation yes. in costs uh, of the uh, BPL development. And actually, perhaps we'll, if we take it from your statement, um, again, it, it, this is really more of an issue for, for Lord Clark, I think, uh, and indeed possibly for other witnesses as well. So if we go to page 98, Shomik. Yep. Paragraph 85.1, you say, I've been referred to a submission sent to ministers dated the 20th of September 1984, seeking approval for a substantial increase in the capital costs for the redevelopment of BPL. The submission was sent to my private office as well as to the Minister of State. And you've summarised here, and I think this means we don't need to go to the underlying material, the three options that were put forward in the submission. Abandon the project, cut the project back to fit the... The, the original budget with a yep. bit of inflation or accept the, the revised budget, essentially. Yes. Um, um, and, and if we go to the next page... You refer... Sorry, let's wait till we get it properly on screen. You refer in paragraphs 85.2 and 85.3 to um, a fairly trenchant response from Mr. Clark and, yes. and, uh, and an, an expression of concern from the Permanent Undersecretary of State, Sir Kenneth Stowe, about two things, the, the magnitude of the cost increase mm -hmm. and, as I understand it, the fact that this was coming as news at this point in time, yes. rather than having been notified at an earlier stage. Is that, that, is that fair? That I think is fair. Um, and then um, you, you've set out uh, in, in your statement... Um, some how that matter then progressed and ver various other uh, uh, exchanges and, 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 and communications. M my understanding, both from your statement and from the documents themselves, is that you had no real involvement in um, the question of how to address or resolve this problem. It was, in, in terms of ministerial input, that was dealt with by Mr Clark because it involved significant sums of, of expenditure? Uh, yes, that is exactly what happened. He took a very, very keen interest in that. Great concern. Um, and, and in that case, I think we'll uh, probably leave that issue and I can, and I can take up um, what the departmental response was then with Mr Clark, who was more directly involved. Um, the, 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 the other issue relevant to the question of achieving self-sufficiency that I wanted to just ask you about fairly shortly um, was the question of a, a, achieving increases in plasma supplies. I, is this right? There were, there were two particular elements to achieving self-sufficiency. One was the redevelopment of BPL itself, yes. so that it had the capacity to process it, enough quantities of yes. plasma to, to produce sufficient domestic concentrates. Yeah. But the second was the need to ensure that sufficient quantities of plasma were sent to BPL in order for them to have the material to process to produce the requisite Yes, this was an issue. Um, and you deal with this in your witness statement, I think, section 80. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to ask you to look at the... I'm not going to put the document on screen, but if you want it for your own reference... Yes. Um, Lord Glen Arthur, it's, it's from page 88 onwards that you deal with this. Page 88 onwards. So what yep. I want to do is just really l look at a very small number of documents, um, in part just to add a little to your witness statement, because there are a couple of documents that I think have come to light since you produced your witness statement, which, which have been shown to you. Um, if we pick it up in February of 1984... Um, you, if, if you want to be following it in your statement, yes. then Arthur, it's paragraph 80.6. Um, yep. um, Dr. Gunson wrote to uh, Dr. Harris, who was one of the deputy chief medical yes. officers, um, raising concerns about whether there was going to be sufficient supplies of plasma um, f f for BPL. 
And if we look at Mr. Sorry, Dr. Harris's response, that's at DHSC 004692 underscore 114. Do you need that reference again, Chimic? D I might have said it wrong. DHSC 0046942 underscore 114. Yes, I'm sorry, I, I missed the digit out there. So we can see it's dated the 15th of February 1984. It, it's from Dr. Harris, Deputy CMO, to Dr. Gunson. Um, he refers in the first paragraph to the letter received from Dr. Gunson. Um, uh, with, with Dr. Gunston's analysis of options on plasma supply for self-sufficiency. And then Dr. Harris says this, we are taking this matter extremely seriously in the department and following discussions with Donald Akerson and my DCMO colleagues, we have decided that a submission to ministers will be required. This will state the nature of the problem and suggest Secretary of State should impress upon regional chairman at an early meeting the importance ministers attach to increasing plasma supply so as to make us self-sufficient. Alan Williams and Alison Smithers will be working on the initial draft, and we will turn to you for guidance on some of the technical details. Uh, and so I think in your statement, um, uh, you um, say uh, um, that you've not been supplied with a copy of the ministerial submission referred to in this letter. No, I haven't been. Um, now, the, the, the reason I'm just going to go to some of the documents is, is really just to add to the picture you've given your statement. The reason we think, um, Lord Glen Arthur, that you weren't supplied with the ministerial submission is that it looks like a decision was taken, contrary to what Dr Harris had set out here, to go not to ministers, but to go instead to the NHS Management Board. And so, because this is additional to the material in your witness statement, I just want to go through it so that the the chronology is apparent to all. Yes. So we, we, we have the le the, this letter from Dr. Harris in uh, February 1984. If we then go to DHSC 0002241 underscore 003. You'll see there, Lord Glen Arthur, um, minutes of a meeting of the Central Blood Laboratories Authority, 28th of March, 1984. And if we go to the bottom of page two, you'll see the heading plasma supply. Dr. Harris referred to his suggestion at the last meeting about the problem of plasma supply being taken up at meetings of regional chairman with the Secretary of State. And pausing there, that seems to reflect the content of the, the letter that we looked at to Dr. Gunson. But confirmed that, unfortunately, these recent meetings have not proved suitable owing to other business. He suggested, therefore, that it would now be more appropriate to report this matter as a point of urgency to the NHS Management Board, as the DHSS were well aware of the problem. Dr. Harris agreed to report back on progress at the authorities' next meeting in May. So it would seem, Lord Glen Arthur, that the decision was taken, perhaps by Dr. Harris, um, uh, that rather than take this matter up with the Secretary of State or, or with yourself as, 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 as Minister, it was going to be taken up urgently with the NHS Management Board. Is, is, is that your reading of the material? That's what it looks like, yes. And then if we pick matters up at the, at the May meeting of the CBLA, which is CBLA 0002007, mm -hmm. And you didn't have the, that last document or the document we're just going to look at when you were drafting your statement. No, I didn't. I've got I'm it just taking, subsequently. Yes, I, well, I'm taking some time with it now. Um, so we can see these are the minutes of the next meeting, the 12th meeting of the CBLA, 23rd of March, 1984. And if we go to page five... Oh, no, sorry. Um... looking at a document which doesn't look like that at all. I 
think that's the wrong document. My apologies. Can we just go to the front of the document again? First page. Yeah, that's the wrong reference. Hold on a moment. Shame it. Can we try CBLA 00049988? That's the one. Thank you. Um, can we go to page five of that? Plasma supply. A copy of a report on plasma supply was received and noted. Sorry, I should have said these are the minutes of the meeting then on the 23rd of May 1984. Dr Gunson said that on the 9th of April 84, he wrote to each regional transfusion director asking for an update on plasma supplies for self-sufficiency. And then it's, there's a reference to their replies being included in Dr. Gunson's report. I'm not going to trouble you with the underlying reports, Lord Alpha. Dr. Harris stressed the need to report the problems of plasma supply to the NHS Interim Management Board as a matter of urgency, stressing the points made in Dr. Gunson's report. This was agreed. Um, now, it, it would seem from this, you, you're probably not in a position to comment on it because I don't think you would have seen these documents at a time, but it would seem from this that, again, Dr. Harris is saying this matter needs to be urgently raised with the NHS Management Board, but it doesn't, doesn't look as though this had necessarily been done by, by, by that stage. C can you recall what the, the, what the role of the NHS Management Board um, was at this point in time and, and, and how its responsibilities interacted with those of the department? No, I'm afraid I can't. I can't recall... Um, exactly what its status was then or whether that status had changed during my time as Don't mind. minister. I, I wasn't trying to put you on the spot there, um, Lord Um if, if we then go to uh, a letter, in any event, we can see, we can pick things up in August 1984 at CBLA 0001870. So, so just to fix the chronology in our mind, Dr. Gunson raises the problem in February 84. Dr. Harris says, we're taking it very seriously. We're going to send the matter to, to ministers. You observe in your statement it never came to you. That seems to be absolutely right, Lord Glen Arthur. March and May 1984, Dr. Harris says, we must raise this urgently with the NHS Management Board. Um, um, the inquiry will no doubt need to look in more detail at what happened in the intervening um, weeks and months. But what we get to here is a letter of the 10th of August, 1984, um, which is sent to all regional administrators uh, um, uh, uh, from the Department of Health, from Mr. Parker. Uh, and it refers to, in the second paragraph, it says, I'm concerned to learn from several regional transfusion directors that they're pessimistic about their chances of attaining the continued growth in plasma procurement so as to reach the target set for 1988. Mm -hmm. Regional health authorities in some cases have not provided the necessary additional funding and others have not been prepared to give a long-term commitment to continued expansion to meet the targets set. Ministers attach considerable importance to the matter of self-sufficiency and the supply of blood and blood products and the procurement of the necessary raw material blood plasma by regional transfusion centres is a vital element in this process. The construction of the enlarged production unit at BPL is well underway. The considerable savings the NHS will make by not having to buy commercial products will not be realised without adequate supplies of blood plasma. So there's the problem being described. Action, I should be glad if you would arrange for your regional health authority to reconsider the steps it's taking in order to ensure that the plasma procurement target set for your region will be met. And the, there's a request to have comments by the end of September. Yes. Um, and then, I'm, I'm not going to go to the further documents, the issue's picked up at a later CBLA meeting um, there is some correspondence that goes out in your name, I think, to Tony Benn MP about, about the issue. Um, the, the, the purpose of showing you those materials, Lord Glenarthur, is, is first of all to, to indicate that it would seem from this that the ministerial submission, which you refer to in your statement as not having been supplied to you, doesn't in fact exist because the matter didn't go to ministers at all. That's what it seems like from what you've explained. Um, do you 
do you have any, any observations or, or thoughts about, about the course that appears to have been taken by Dr Harris, which was to go to the NHS Management Board instead of ministers? Do you think it should have come to ministers? It, it did indicate uh, on one of those documents that the original idea had been to raise it with the Secretary of State at one of his regional chairman's meetings, um, but that for one reason or another that could not be fitted in. Um, uh, uh, why that should have happened, I, I, I have no idea. I did attend a number of regional chairman's meetings with the Secretary of State over the two years I was in the department. I can't recall an awful lot about them, quite honestly, um, and I have no idea whether whether this sort of issue was raised at any of them. So I'm afraid I can't help you. Um, d do you have any concerns about the, the time frame from... Dr. Gunson raising these concerns in February 1984, and then it being August of 1984 before there's a, a letter sent out to regional administrators requiring action. Given what was said to be the urgency of this, do you think February to August 1984 is, is too long a period of time? Well, so it appears. I mean, there the, the, the did seem to be an awful lot of... Uh, what's the word? Um, there was, there was a, in so many of these things, there was a, a long period of pre-digestion within the department before action was taken. That seemed to be the nature of the beast. Um, uh, frustratingly, I think, in many cases, and no doubt frustratingly for uh, Dr. Gunson in this particular case. But I can't explain uh, why, other than that it's being tossed around in the official, in official circles. Uh, and... Um, uh, uh, it, it may be that some of these matters were brought to your attention. It may be they weren't. I don't think we can tell from the documentation available. So I'm just going to put my next question to you as a matter of general principle. Yeah. Um, given the importance of the policy of self-sufficiency and given the importance of increasing plasma supply in order to be able to achieve the policy of self-sufficiency, is this something which, as a matter of fact, you think ministers should have been closely briefed on and kept up to date with developments? Well, I think that would have been helpful and, uh, uh, and kept us in the frame so that we were aware of what's going on and, 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 and intervened if necessary one way or the other, preferably to speed it up. But we weren't, so we uh, couldn't act. Uh, and, 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 it, and it is right to note, and I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately taking this quite quickly without going to all the documents because you weren't closely involved but your statement explains and, and produces the documents. You did, for example, give a speech in September 1984 to a, the British Blood Transfusion Society yes. in which you referred to the request having gone to regional health authorities. So you obviously had been told at least by that date that that yes. action was being undertaken. So I, I don't want to put things on an incorrect factual basis to you. Um, can I then move away from self-sufficiency and BPL altogether to a discrete topic... Um, which concerns um, the collection of blood from prisons. So if we go to PRSC 0004729, um, you'll, you'll see there, Lord Glenarfer, and I don't think there's any evidence that this is something that crossed your desk at the time. No. Um, it's a minute from Mr. Wynne Stanley to Mr. Brown, dated the 23rd of August 1983. If we just look at the list of those who are copied, is there anyone there in your private office? Not in mine, no. Um, and so if we go to the top of the page, we can see it's headed use of blood from prisons. Um, I'm replying on behalf of Mr. Parker to your minute to him of the 27th of July. We haven't troubled you with that as well, Auckland Arthur. I think we looked at that with Dr. Walker. Okay. Um, it's difficult to advise any particular departmental policy on the collection of blood from brawl stalls and prisons at the moment. It is for re individual regional transfusion directors to determine how and from where donations are sought in the light of the targets they need to achieve and the numbers of donors on their panels. However, transfusion directors have been aware of the dangers of relying too heavily on prisons as a source of donations for some time i.e. prior to the advent of AIDS as a cause for concern, of concern because of the risk of hepatitis in prisons, also connected with a higher incidence of homosexuality, which can be spread through blood transfusion. Nevertheless, although most regions, especially those with no shortage of donors, may not need to use prisons, 
there is at least one which has to view them as a major source of donations in order to meet the targets. Uh, um, AIDS has now, of course, called into wisdom. AIDS has now, of course, called the wisdom of continuing to view prisons as a source of blood even further into question, and the directors are due to discuss it at their next meeting in September. If the risks are now considered too great to justify continued collection from prisons, some measures will be needed to compensate for the loss of that source of donors, perhaps, for example, a system whereby regions uh, with no need to rely on prisons can take extra blood to be transferred to those regions for whom the loss of prisons as a source of blood will cause difficulties. Um, then there's reference in the... Uh, uh, final paragraph to advising Mr. Brown of developments, debate on the problem by transfusion directors in Scotland with no particular policy line uh, and liaison with the Home Office. And it said that they had in the past been very much in favour of blood donation by prisoners. Now, before I ask you to look at one other document from August 1983, were you aware as the minister with responsibility for blood and blood products that blood was still being collected, it would seem, in 1983, to some extent at least, in England and Wales from prisons or, or a prison? I don't believe I was. I, I, I was aware that it was happening in the States. But I don't think I was, nor latterly, when I was the Home Office Minister responsible for prisons, do I recall ever being informed about it? Not that I can recall, anyway. Was that something that, as, as a minister with responsibility for overseeing, to some extent, the safety of the blood supply, should have been brought to your attention, do you think? Well, I think it probably should have been brought to my attention because um, the, the same dif difficulties uh, are expressed in, this, in Mr Wynne Stanley's uh, minute here. Uh, as ref uh, the same concerns as reflected the issue in the United States. So I would have been surprised that it hadn't been brought to my attention. I don't recall it being brought to my attention. Uh, certainly, I don't think we've uh, uh, uncovered any, any evidence of it being brought to your attention. And uh, obviously, if that, if, if that changes, we'll, um, we'll uh, clarify the position. Um, uh, if it had been brought to your attention, do you think you would have wanted to to try and take some action to, to bring the practice to an end because of the obvious risk? Yes, I certainly wanted to ask, was this um, a, a wise way to proceed? Um, now, the other document I'm going to put to you is, is, or, or ask you to look at is from the same time, uh, and it, it's a document, again, not a document you'd have seen at the time, it's a document from um, one Scottish director to the, na the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service director. Um, it's PRSC 0002981. Um, it's the 23rd of August, 83, so it's the same date. Yep. And, and it's from Dr. Brooks, uh, Regional Director of the East of Scotland Blood Transfusion Service, to Dr. Cash of SNBTS. I, I draw attention to it really only for the sake of, 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 of completeness and balance. Uh, at the bottom paragraph, donor sessions at prisons and brawstools, um, it says, you asked me to discuss this with my colleagues. So that's referring to internal Scottish directors, uh, um, as, as I understand it. Um, uh, or perhaps, in fact, more widely. In fact, no discussion was necessary since, as far as England and Wales are concerned, these sessions have already been stopped. Yes. It's now left to the Scottish regions to decide whether they will do the same. So we have a slight curiosity, Lord Bernardo, and I don't think we've got to the bottom of it yet, but two letters on the same date. Yeah, they're the same date, just which, 84? Yeah, no, no, um, top of, exactly three, the same yeah. date, okay. in fact. Yes, yeah. Two letters on the same date. The Scottish one seems yeah. to think that the practice has stopped in England and Wales. The internal DHSS memo seems yeah. to think that it's still going on, yeah. at least in one area. I don't expect you to be able to resolve that, but having asked you about the one document, I wanted to put the other document, Thank which you. suggested it had stopped um, on, on, on the record. Yeah. Um, can I then ask you um, just a, a little about the question of hepatitis, because it was referred to in, in, in the first of the two prison minutes that we looked at. But obviously, my questions to you have very much been about AIDS. Yes. Um, because that was the public health emergency into which you were, as it were, precipitated as minister in 1983. What, what if anything, can you recall being told about um, 
hepatitis viruses and um, the, the link between blood, blood products being administered to patients and the transmission of hepatitis? I believe I can recall that one of the earlier concerns about contaminated blood was because of hepatitis, non-A, non-B hepatitis, um, from the United States before the arrival of the AIDS issue and that the whole purpose of uh, ensuring that, um, uh, that unaffected blood, that word un in effect, um, you know, non, uh, what's the word? unaffected blood was based on, on hepatitis. But AIDS came in on top of that. So yes, but I don't remember it in any great detail. Were you aware, um, no, let me put it in a different way. What, what, what was your understanding of the seriousness or potential seriousness of non-A, non-B hepatitis? Well, uh, I, I believed it to be a, a very serious condition, but I, I, I don't know the science of it. Um, the, there's comparatively little reference to hepatitis in the materials we've looked at. Yep. Again, um, unsurprisingly, it might be said, um, multiple references to AIDS, but, but, yes. but, but little in relation to hepatitis. C can you recall, if you leave aside the question of the, the redevelopment of BPL and the policy of self-sufficiency, and it's a big thing, obviously, in one sense, to leave aside, but can, can you recall ever being asked to consider any other steps um, or, or measures that might um, avoid or minimise the risks of transmission of hepatitis during your time as minister? No, I don't, but I think I've seen subsequently that um, heat treatment, as one example, was something that didn't necessarily uh, solve the non-A, non-B hepatitis uh, issue if blood was treated that way. Uh, but I can recall no more than that off the top of my head. Um, you, you described in your statement and you've described in the course of your oral evidence the, the balance of risk exercise that um, was essentially undertaken within the department with, on the one hand, um, the risk to haemophiliacs if... Uh, concentrates were not available to them mm -hmm. um, uh, um, and, and we, we ventilated the nature of that risk yesterday I'm not going back to that so that was one side of the balance and then you you put or you described being put on the other side of the balance the risk to haemophiliacs from AIDS yes which was described to you in the various materials we yeah. looked at as small or sometimes very small mm -hmm. It doesn't appear that the risk from non-A, non-B hepatitis, which itself could be fatal either in yes. the short term or the longer term, yeah. was put into the balance at that point. In other words, you weren't just dealing with uh, um, uh, what was believed, rightly or wrongly, to be a small risk of infection with AIDS. You were also dealing with a very high risk, some, some describe it as a near in inevitability of infection with non-A, non-B hepatitis. Now, the, I should say in the interest of, of, of fairness, non-A, non-B hepatitis is also an, a significant problem in terms of the domestic blood supply. Mm. But d d do you know why, in undertaking that balance, the, the issue of non-A, non-B hepatitis doesn't appear to have factored in in, in the department's decision-making process? In, and specifically in 1983, I'm talking about. No, I don't know. And uh, I'm quite surprised that it wasn't flagged up. Uh, for example, in the first uh, briefing I had from uh, Dr. Walford, uh, or highlighted in some way, I can't recall without looking at it, whether or not it referred to it at all. But um, uh, you know, I, if, if it was so serious, then I, I'm quite surprised it wasn't flagged up. And, and then if I can just ask you just a little more about um, risks from, from what's sometimes referred to as whole blood, so not blood products, but blood transfusions. Yes. 
we've, we've talked in the course of your evidence about two measures um, relevant to um, transfusion. One was the leaflet, the AIDS yes. leaflet designed to deter high-risk um, uh, uh, donors from, from giving blood. And then there's, of course, the, the, the issue that we touched on, the screening test. Yes. Um, d do you recall whether the question of minimising the risks of in infecting people from transfusions of, of whole blood, whether that was ever discussed with you other than by reference to the leaflet or the screening test, which was usually looked at in relation to the risk to, to haemophiliacs? I can't be sure, but I don't believe it was. Um, just then, a, a, I think one further issue in relation to your time as minister, and, and then I've just got some questions I want to ask you um, in, in, in general terms about your role in when you were Minister of State for Scotland. Um, the, 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 the last issue in relation to your period as minister within the Department of Health is this. The expert advisory group on AIDS was established, I think, late, late 84, met for the first time in any event in January 1985. Yes. I'm um, uh, not going to ask you detailed questions about its, it, its work or terms of reference or its establishment, but um, do you think it would have been a good thing, better course, to have established an, a body such as that that could from an expert perspective, external to the department, analyze all the, the, the material in relation to AIDS and provide advice to the department at a much earlier stage than January 1985? Uh, yes, I think it probably um, would have been. I, I, I can't remember how um, the decision to set up that body was arrived at, whether it was, I don't believe it came to ministers, um, it may have done, I can't remember, um, uh, but it would have been something that I think should have been generated to the medical chain, starting uh, with somebody approaching the chief medical officer and saying, get it done through your channels. And, and that actually leads me to one further matter I did want to explore with you before we look at Scotland, and that is the role of the chief medical officer. Um, now, it it, it doesn't appear from the material we've looked at, and obviously for the purposes of your evidence, that's very much focused upon issues that you were involved yeah. in or, 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 or copied into, or, or perhaps should have been copied into but weren't. Um, um, so the material you've looked at is obviously not an exhaustive survey of, of, of all the, 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 the actions and decisions being taken by the Chief Medical Officer during this time. Um, but it, it doesn't seem from your evidence that you had much, if any, direct interaction with the chief medical officer on the issue of blood and blood products and AIDS. Is, is that right? Uh, that is correct. I, I didn't uh, have that contact. And if I'm allowed yes. to just add to that, it's very difficult to discern from the voluminous uh, documentation that I've got here at to, uh, what point uh, or at what points the, um, the more junior uh, people in the medical chain actually reported to him. I, I, I have no idea. It would be very interesting to see uh, to what extent he was actively involved, and I don't know the answer. And it, it is right, of course, to note we do see Dr Harris, who was a deputy chief medical officer, yes, referred well, to um, on, on a number of occasions. But w in, in terms of... Areas such as obtaining information from some of the multiple experts, committees, working parties, expert groups, the, the chief medical officer or, or his, his team yeah. would be um, particularly well-placed, would they not, to undertake that kind of task rather than it um, 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 being, being left to... It, rather than it being a ministerial task, perhaps, it would be... Is this right? Something you'd expect the chief medical officer to be doing? Yes. Uh, going to be done uh, his either. team would be the people who would be best placed to advise on that and suggest it. Uh, and um, if it came to wanting to perhaps robustly review or, 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 or challenge or play devil's advocate in relation to the kind of information the 
the department might be getting from others. Again, would it really be, if you're talking about medical matters, clinical matters, very much something the chief medical officer and his team, again, would, would be the well-placed, one would have thought, to undertake that kind of role, that the critical scrutiny of, of the information that the department might be receiving? Yes, I believe that is correct. Um, and then the disseminate, dissemination of information to doctors or patients, and obviously we've discussed the issues yes. in relation to that in some detail. But we know, I think, that uh, D D Dr. Aitchison did send out a Dear Doctor letter in relation to AIDS in 1985. But again, um, it, it, would it most likely have been through the office of the Chief Medical Officer that the department would have most readily been able to provide information to doctors or provide information to patient groups? That would have been the, the natural conduit. That would be the natural course, yes. Can I then come um, to, to Scotland? Um, if we go in your statement, can we go back to, to your office statement, please? Um, and go to page 115. So WITN 5282001. Thank you. So we can see under the heading later roles, you say as Minister of State for Scotland from September 1986 until June 1987, I had responsibility for health under the Secretary of State for Scotland, Mr Malcolm Riftkind. I do not recall detail about blood or blood products per se, but I do recall being advised to and agreed to needle exchange in order to prevent the cross-contamination of AIDS, hepatitis and other diseases by drug abusers. And then on 102, you say at the time I would have had overall responsibility for blood, blood products and related matters and recompense and support for people infected and affected by HIV and hepatitis as a result of transfusions of blood and blood products. But I'm now unaware of the detail and, and have no records. And then you set out um, some very limited information you've been able to give um, about m meetings, um, a, a meeting in relation to AIDS in January 1987, and attendance at, at one of the meetings um, on, on the 9th of April 1987 uh, uh, of the Cabinet Home Affairs and Social Affairs Subcommittee on AIDS. Um, now, I recognise fully, Lord Glenarvan, that you've not been provided with documents relating to this time in order to be able to refresh your memory. So. The questions I'm going to ask you about it are going to be very general in their nature. Um, and and it, 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 it may be, I don't know, that you can't take your statement any further without seeing underlying documents. Um, um, but is this right? You, you'd have, you were, um, in, in terms of the ministerial responsibilities within the Scottish office, mm -hmm. Health was one of your areas, and thus blood and blood products would have come under the health umbrella. Yes, it would have done. Health, I mean, there are another series of issues as well as health, but health was one of them, and uh, that was all encompassing so far as health was concerned, and, and um, every aspect, yeah. Now, you'd obviously have come to the Scottish role, I think, with an intervening period at the Home Office, as yeah. you mentioned, but with a, a, a degree of knowledge in relation to blood and blood products and, and, and AIDS mm -hmm. um, to, to hepatitis to a lesser extent that you'd have acquired from your role at the Department of Health. D do you recall whether taking up the health responsibility in Scotland you, you made any inquiries or requested information about what the situation was in relation to in infection from blood and blood products in Scotland? I may have done. I honestly can't recall now. Um, and no documentation has been uh, shown to me to suggest that I, I, I might have um, asked for a briefing on it, find out where Scotland was in comparison to, to England or anything like that, I'm afraid. Uh, and, Lord Glenarvan, we may have to come back to you at least for a further statement if, if such documentation is found, um, because I do appreciate you've not, you've not, you've not, Fine, thank you. you've not had it. Um, c can you recall anything at all about the, the decision-making structures? You've described the decision-making structures within the Department of Health on health matters. So there was, um, we've got the parallel hierarchy as Chief Medical Officer, Administrative hi um, Civil Servants, um, the private office, uh, and, and you've described how information came to you, and, and, and we've looked at the ma lots of examples of when information didn't come to you. D do you recall whether it functioned in a similar way at, 
at the Scottish office in terms of health responsibilities? I th um, not, not in any great detail. The, 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 I think there was a chief medical officer for Scotland and there was a head of the Scottish Home and Health Department who was an official. And uh, there would have been a stream dealing with various aspects, but I'm afraid I do simply do not recall any of it in, in detail, rather surprisingly. Um, and um, uh, do you recall what the precise relationship was between the, 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 the Scottish office as the overarching, as it were, government department that you were appointed to and the Scottish Home and Health Department? I, don't, I can't recall what the other branches were in the Scottish office because it was Scottish Home and Health that I dealt with most of the time, uh, as well as, you know, there was industry, there was uh, a whole series of different elements, and I only concentrated on, I think, three or four of them. I can't remember now. Uh, um, do, do you have any recollection um, at, at all of whether the approach in, in Scotland was um, to... to to, as it were, go its own way, plough plow its own furrow on the basis of its own independent advice, or, or whether it was a question of trying to peg what it was doing to what was being done at, at the department in relation to England and Wales? Well, I, I can't be sure, but I'm sure that there was close liaison between um, the uh, between England and Scotland and no doubt Wales and Northern Ireland on these, these issues. I, I simply cannot recall exactly how it worked, but uh, there was evidence in some of the other material I've seen where SSHD... Uh, were, were, were copied in. Uh, and then l last question for now. I'm, I, I'm going to ask it because I've been asked to. I, I rather suspect from what you've been able to say that without documents, you, you, to prompt your memory, you're not going to be able to answer it. But um, th 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 there's a particular issue in relation to blood products in Scotland it, 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 in 1986, 1987, in, in terms of um, products in England that that may have been treated so as to eliminate non-A, non-B hepatitis not being available in Scotland until a later date. Do you have any recollection, without any documents I'm afraid to prompt you, any recollection of that issue? Uh, no, I don't, I'm afraid. Um, just, just then one final question. Um, for now, for me, Lord Glenartha, if you go to back to your statement, WITN 5282001, page 117, and it's paragraph 108, you say, you say this, I've been asked if I have anything more to add. I believe I've covered as much as I can in relation to a matter with which I was dealing some 38 years ago and in which I had no prior knowledge or experience. It is without doubt that the decisions taken at the time have had tragic consequences for many. This is deeply troubling. However, the decisions taken were on the best scientific, clinical, administrative, and well-meaning advice available at the time, and it's very difficult to use contemporary attitudes and scientific advances to gainsay the decisions taken at the time. I want to ask you only about one of the, 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 the observations you make, and it's where you say the decisions taken were on the best scientific, clinical, administrative, and well-meaning advice available at the time. Um, given the material we've looked at and the issues we've explored over the course of, of, of yesterday and, and, and today, Lord Glenartha, and knowing, as I think you may, may now know, quite a lot of material that didn't come your way, do you think you're in a position to, to maintain that the decisions taken were on the best scientific, clinical, administrative advice available at the time? I think I would add now, after the words, however the decisions taken were, to the best of my belief, the best scientific, etc. Because I had no reason uh, to doubt the advice that I was being given because I was not qualified in the same way as those experts were. I understand. Thank you. Um, so those are my questions for Lord Glenartha as things stand, but obviously we need to provide the opportunity to call participants and their recognised legal representatives to suggest any further questions they wish to have considered. 
So if we could take a break for half an hour, I'd be very grateful. Uh, yes, you think uh, you've, half an hour will be enough, do you? I do think half an hour will be enough. Yes. Uh, very, very well. Well, uh, Lord Glenartha, what, what happens at this stage, uh, you may know already, but let, if not, let me tell you anyway. Yeah. Um, at this stage, uh, there are possibly further questions to be asked by core participants, whoever they are, uh, and the, the routine is that uh, they are channeled through counsel to the inquiry. Yes. So she will uh, be given questions, uh, and if there are any, uh, and then uh, you, those questions will be put to you when you come back. But obviously that needs a break, uh, and it comes at a convenient time for a cup of tea. So we'll come back, uh, shall we, uh, at 25 to, to 4. Th thank you very much, Sir Brian. Thank you, sir.